found love beyond all reason. You gave your life your all for me. Only yours forever. Caught in mercy, fall out. Found hope, found life, found all life. You're all I need. The time has come. Stand for all we believe in. So I, for one, am gonna give my praise to you. Today, today, it's all or nothing. All the way, praise goes out to you. Yeah, all the praise goes. You're all for me Call me yours forever Caught in mercy, fall out Found hope, found life, found all I need You're all I need The time has gone To stand for all we believe in So I short of the glory of God and because there cannot be anything unclean entering into the kingdom of God we are separated but then the grace of God is our everlasting hope that unlocks the gates of heaven through his son Jesus we are accepted. By grace, we grow from flawed and limited beings into beings of truth and light. Grace empowers us to be overcomers, to reign in life and to fulfill divine destiny. This is God's 
amazing grace. Greetings and thank you for joining us on Living Strong today. We are doing a uh, uh, very interesting series talking about God's amazing grace. Uh, we are several weeks into this and um, at the present time we are talking about God's grace in everyday life. How the grace of God works in us on a day-to-day -day basis, what's available to us uh, because of God's grace uh, and, and in everyday life. Uh, working, uh, working in our lives on a day, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. We covered four aspects of this um, in the previous episode. We talked about God's grace, that uh, grace that embraces us. We talked about grace that empowers us for godly living. We talked about grace to overcome temptation. Uh, we also talked about grace that strengthens us when we face opposition, demonic opposition, and things that the enemy might do against us. So we want to take this further and talk about some more areas where the grace of God works in our daily life. Number five, there is grace that provides, grace that brings provision into our life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, as Paul is teaching the believers in Corinth and encouraging them to give to the work of God's kingdom, this is what he writes. He says, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully so let each one give as he purposes in his heart not grudgingly or of necessity for god loves a cheerful giver and god is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work so while he's encouraging the believers in Corinth to contribute, to give, and in the actual historical setting, what Paul was doing was he was gathering offerings from different churches in um, that region in Macedonia and Achaia, from different churches. He was collecting an offering to take it to the saints in Jerusalem, uh, the, the believers in Jerusalem who were going through a hard time. So he was encouraging different churches to give, and this is part of his writing to the church in Corinth, where he's encouraging them to give. And he says, you know, if you sow bountifully, you are going to reap bountifully. And he says, you know, God really loves a cheerful giver. So he's encouraging them to give. But in the talk context of money and in the context of giving and the context of needs being met, he then says this in verse 8. He says, God is able to make all grace abound to a Jew. You see, when you give, uh, you give with this confidence. You give knowing that God will make all grace abound to a Jew in such a manner that you will always have all sufficiency in all things and you will personally yourselves be able to abound to every good work. So on the one hand, I'm giving because God empowered me to give, but I also know that God is able to make all of His grace abound toward me and this grace is going to take care of all my needs in such a way that I will have much more I will have enough and more for every good thing God's called me to do. So this is grace that actually brings provision, grace that provides for us. And uh, it is not that I'm trying to buy this grace. Remember, grace is always something that God gives because of who He is and not because of what we merit. Uh, we are only positioning ourselves to be recipients of His grace. We cannot earn that grace. We cannot work uh, into that grace. All we do is put ourselves in the right position to receive that grace. And in, uh, one of the things Paul is teaching us here, to position ourselves to receive God's grace that provides, is by first being sowers or givers, uh, just giving whatever we can, giving whatever we have. We give knowing that as we do that, God will make all of His grace freely abound towards us so that He will bless us so much that we will have more than enough to do the things God has called us to do. Psalm 84 and verse 11 says that the Lord God is a sun and a shield. Uh, he will give grace and glory, and no good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. So in the context of God giving us grace, He says, you know, He will not withhold anything from those who walk uprightly. There is grace that brings provision. And so we can ask for that. You say, God, I just pray for your grace to meet this need. I pray that grace will be released, whether it's for yourself or you're praying for somebody else. God, I pray for the release of your grace upon 
that person, God, to meet this need, uh, to bring provision, uh, to bring abundance in their lives. Pray the blessing of the grace that brings provision into their lives. Number six, another aspect of God's grace at work in our everyday life is that there is grace that empowers us to conquer and reign in life. There is grace that empowers the believer to live in a place of uh, victory, in a place of triumph, in a place of dominion, in a place that conquers, and in a place that rules and reigns. And there is that the work of grace in, for um, this work of grace is available to every believer. In the Old Testament book of Zechariah, chapter 4, uh, verses 6 through 9, uh, the Lord God is speaking on behalf of Zerubbabel, who is the governor uh, of, his, of his people at that time. They had a huge task before them uh, to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. This was right after the Babylonian captivity. And they'd gone back to Jerusalem, and uh, the task was to rebuild the temple. Uh, the people initially began doing that, but then they were all discouraged. And so there was a big gap, probably uh, for about uh, 13 years or so, there was a big gap where they just stopped working on the temple. They've been very discouraged. And now um, God is speaking to Zerubbabel, who's the governor, uh, through the prophet Zechariah. And this is what the Lord tells him. He says in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, he says, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Who are you a great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And he will bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands also shall finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. So Zechariah, speaking by the Holy Spirit, tells uh, Zerubbabel, he says, Zerubbabel, you know, you think like this is a great mountain before you, but God says it's going to just become a plain. And you laid the foundation stone. You are also going to put the capstone or the finishing stone for the building of this temple. And you're going to do it by shouting grace, grace to it. What is this thing about shouting grace, grace? Meaning you, you are going to proclaim grace that this work is going to be done by the grace of God. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Holy Spirit. And all you are going to do to walk in that power of the Holy Spirit is you are going to proclaim grace, grace. You're going to shout grace, grace to your mountain. And, and as you proclaim grace against your mountain, you are going to walk in that empowering of the Spirit of God at work in your life it's going to help you to complete this task of rebuilding the temple. So really, this grace and us proclaiming grace, us declaring God's grace upon our lives, is, is, is going to empower us to conquer and reign over, conquer over and reign in life. In the book of Romans, the fifth chapter, where, where Paul writes so beautifully talking about uh, the redemption that's in Jesus, the reconciliation we have with God, God's amazing, abundant grace given to us, which then therefore brings to us the gift of righteousness. Paul uh, takes that forward there in Romans 5 and verse 17, and he says, Those who have received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. So becoming recipients of God's abundant grace and becoming recipients of God's gift of righteousness now positions us to reign in life. What does it mean? It means that in life, on this earth, as we journey through earth, the empowering work of grace and righteousness in our lives uh, makes us overcome us, puts us in a place of conquering the things that come against us in, in this world, in this life, that we rule and reign and dominate and have dominion in life. So understand that the work of God's, God's grace empowers us to conquer whatever it is that you're facing. Maybe it's a mountain, maybe it's a challenge. You un, uh, proclaim grace. No, understand that there is God's empowering grace to help you conquer it, to help you reign in life, to dominate it. So you don't have to go under it. You don't have to be subject to it. You can conquer it by God's empowering grace working in your life. 
Another last aspect of grace that we want to talk about, uh, the grace that works in everyday life, is grace that disciplines. Just, we talk, just as we talked about grace at work in our lives, bringing about so many other things, uh, giving us a strength to overcome temptation, to live godly, uh, to overcome, uh, that strengthens us to face opposition, uh, to overcome challenges, to conquer, that brings provision. The Bible also presents grace that actually disciplines us. God in His grace, in His divine favor, in His divine work uh, of favor in our lives, out of that grace also disciplines us. And this is brought out to us in um, the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 12. We'll read verses 5 through 7. The writer of Hebrews says this, And have you forgotten the exhortation uh, which speaks to you as to sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you end your chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have hu had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down on the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may be may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Now in this entire passage, Hebrews 12, and I've, I've actually read verses 5 through 17, a, a lengthy passage, the writer of Hebrews tells us about the fact that God chastens people, his own children. To chasten simply means to lovingly correct, to discipline, uh, to, uh, to deal with them as a father would deal with sons whom he is bringing up. He wants them to come up in the right way. Uh, to be nurtured well, and so he has to discipline, lovingly correct them. Sometimes he lovingly corrects through words that he speaks, and, and there may be other forms in which he, he brings about this discipline in, in, in their lives. But the whole intent is to bring them up in the right way. And he says, so also God deals with us because we are his sons and daughters, that he lovingly corrects us, through, uh, and he, he would correct us through his word, through his spirit, through other people. He would bring correction into our lives. All of this, he, he says, he does so that we could be trained in holiness, that we could become partakers of his holiness, that we could become a holy people. And then he continues, he says, you know, now when you're receiving this correction, don't uh, faint, don't become faint-hearted, but strengthen those hands and, 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 and make firm your path uh, as you're receiving correction. Receiving correction is not a reason to become faint-hearted. Receiving correction is not an excuse to become weak and say, oh, you know, I, I give up. God is correcting me. No. Instead, it is time for us to strengthen ourselves, receive the correction well, be encouraged that God is actually correcting us and, and working in us to bring us to a place of righteousness and holiness. So strengthen those hands and then continue to walk in peace with all people and holiness. And then he says in verse 15, be careful that you don't fall short of the grace of God. So in God's dealing with us, even in his dealing with us and bringing discipline, even in bringing divine correction, it is a work of grace. And I must learn to receive that correctly. I must continue to walk correctly and so that I don't fall short of what he's trying to accomplish through his grace at work in my life. If I reject his correction, if I reject what he's lovingly doing in my life as a work of grace, I am actually falling short of what he is making available to me through his grace. And so Paul says, or the writer of Hebrews says, make sure 
that you don't fall short of the grace of God. Uh, don't let any bitterness come up in your heart. You know, don't get angry. Don't get bitter that God is disciplining you or correcting you or telling you to change some things in your life. No, because if you become bitter, you're falling short. You're going to miss out on the work of grace that God wants to do in your life. And not only that, but that bitterness will also affect other people and others become defiled and uh, you will forfeit the very thing that God is intending to bless you with. So here we've talked about um, uh, several dis- uh, different aspects of grace. Grace that embraces us, grace that gives us, uh, go- helps us live godly, a grace that helps us overcome temptation, a grace that strengthens us, grace that provides, a grace that conquers and reigns, and grace that disciplines us. Now, on a daily basis, we need to walk in this. I mean, we need to experience this and say, God, this is mine. I receive it. I welcome it. We receive God's grace by faith. Uh, We receive God's grace by walking in humility. Uh, We come to his throne of grace and ask him for grace. And we learn to give God thanks for his grace. I have a calling to be salt and light. I'm part of a family that empowers me to fulfill this commission. I have a job, but then I was always passionate to study the Word. We are students from different walks of life. My potential is best tapped in an environment like this. Where I get the opportunity to reach out and to minister. A culture where there's supernatural impartation through anointed leaders. I can now aim for excellence because that is God's beautiful design. I am equipped to impact. Come. Discover. Fulfill. Admissions are now open for the academic year 2016 for the following courses. A two-year full-time course at APC Bible College, Bangalore starting in July. A short-term course in Hindi in Varanasi, UP starting in October. And a short-term course in Oriya in Perampur, Orissa starting in October. For inquiries about these courses and other details, please do get in touch with us on our toll-free number 1-800-300-00998, our mobile number 99457-09777 or 080-656-10823. You can also email us at contact at apcwo.org. The application forms for these courses can be downloaded from our website apcwo.org slash Bible College. Thank you so much for being with us on the program today. And before we close, we'd just like to take a moment uh, to pray. And I just want to pray that God's grace will be released and God's grace will be imparted in a greater measure on your life. Praying God's grace will be released to work and if bring into effect all of these things that we've been talking about. All you and I need to do is by faith open and receive and by faith ask Him for this grace in every area of our life. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank You for what Your grace works in our lives. And Father, I pray for a release of more grace in those watching, Father, in each person watching, more grace, grace that brings provision, Grace that helps us conquer and reign in life. Oh, grace that, that corrects us lovingly and puts us on the right path. And we pray we'll be able to receive that uh, in the right way that you want us to receive it. Uh, oh, God, grace that, uh, uh, that helps us, strengthens us, and helps us overcome challenges and mountains. I just pray for a release of more grace in each person walk, watching God. And we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us on the program today. And until next time, remember, live life to Jesus' way. When God moves in an unusual way, the dead come back to life. There is power in His visitation and a mighty outpouring in His habitation, bringing a revival in our churches and our ministry. All People's Church presents Get ready to host 
revivals, visitations, and moves of God.